Easter Island is a very small place. It's located about 2,000 miles off the coast of Chile and is 5 miles by 7 miles by 10 miles in size with a population of about 6,000 to 7,000 people. Now this is a series, I'm going to do five or six videos from our recent trip to Easter Island and this is the Orongo Crater. You can see it's a volcanic crater and it's quite massive and it has Totora reed growing in the center. Totora reed is also found on the coast of Peru and also in Lake Titicaca. The entire island is a series of volcanoes, very ancient, and this location is also at Arango. This is where the Birdman competition was held in times prior to the arrival of Europeans in the early 18th century. And these little islands offshore are where the native people, it was a man's tradition to swim to the far island there and collect an egg. And if he was successful in making it back without being eaten by sharks, then he became the king or chief of the island for a year. So these are the quite simple stone, basalt stone houses that um, were where the birdmen competition people would live. But then there are some odd artifacts such as this piece of stone which looks like it was shaped by some kind of sophisticated tool. And that is why Easter Island, or Rapa Nui, or Tepito Te Otehenawa, is quite a fascinating place because we're going to be seeing examples of lost ancient high technology here. But first, I wanted to show you again the rather simple houses that were constructed of slabs of basalt. Like this one, you can see simply broken slabs were stacked on top of one another in an orderly fashion, all near the rim of this crater. There are some more of the houses. And again, another inspection as we go past my beautiful wife Irene of the simple slab construction that we see at Orongo. So it's probably a later period of construction, just prior to the arrival of the Europeans, as I said. The first European to arrive was Rogovine, who's a Dutch explorer, and he's the one who named the island Easter Island because he landed there on Easter Sunday. And then we have some relatively simple temple circular complexes here, constructed probably out of older buildings. And now, this is the small town on the island. There's only one. And we're driving to a different location, and this is Vinapu. So we have to go past the airport. And this is the location of Vinapu, right on the coast. And quite a complex area because it has different types of construction, all out of stone. So as we walk along, we're looking at some rather large blocks of basalt, uh, not well fitted together here. But as we move closer to the left, you see they do fit together quite tightly. And these weigh one ton or more, but then the stone quality reduces. But this is the phenomenal wall at Vinapu that's partially destroyed. And it is similar to construction that we see uh, in the highlands of Peru and to some degree also in places like Egypt. You see super tight fitting stone, uh, very different from most of the construction we see on the island. There, of course, is one of the famous heads, of which there are 950. But as you're going to see, this is very atypical construction on Easter Island and hints that an older civilization was once there, did this construction, then the island was hit by a massive cataclysm which damaged part of the wall. 
And again, this is evidenced here. You see rather crude construction technique in comparison to the beautiful but damaged technique used at the Vinapu wall. And as we walk around to the side, again, very crude construction in front and superior construction in behind. And again, there's the superior construction. In behind, we have some fallen Moai statues and then slabs that look like they were thrown from their original position. And here too, a small wall section of very big slabs of stone. Clearly these have, it's either been damaged or reassembled. And then much rougher work on the left hand side. Those two large ones are quite impressive. And now we're walking up to one of the Pukau um, so-called hats, or more probably that is a top knot. That is what the uh, royal people's hair looked like. They would tie their hair up into a top knot, and they're all red, which could indicate that these people actually had red hair, which of course is not uh, what Polynesians look like. But what we're seeing as we go through this video and others in the series is that there appear to have been two different types of construction. The first one superior and the second inferior. And so what I'm believing and others believe is that the Polynesians arrived on Easter Island about 1,000 years ago and they found the remains of a more advanced technological civilization Possibly there, there were some people still living there from the earlier time period. And when Rogovin landed on Easter Island, uh, what was recorded in his log book was that they saw tall people, they saw short people, they saw black-haired people, they saw red-haired people, they even saw blonde-haired people. As well, they saw light-skinned people and they saw dark-skinned people. So here... What you're looking at is a rebuilt wall, probably done during the Polynesian time period. Some of the stones are quite large, others very small. And that's in stark contrast to the Vinapu wall you saw earlier. There again is one of the Pukau top knots. And now we're walking up to another one of the fallen Moai. And they seem to be from two time periods as well. The small ones are like this. That's, of course, simply the head but there are much larger ones with so-called aquiline noses. So again, possible reconstruction of a somewhat megalithic wall. And now we're going to look at inferior construction. And again, one of the fallen heads, each one of the Moai, the 950 of them, were originally full figures with uh, one or two being on the order of 35 feet tall or more. There's also one Moai in the quarry, unfinished, which uh, would weigh 180 tons if it was ever completed. And a view of the quarry will come up in a future video in this series. Here again are some massive slabs that look like they've been recycled during the Polynesian time frame. And now we're going back to the Vinapu megalithic wall, but this is the back side where you're having a look at some fallen smaller moai. So these were ones probably made during the Polynesian time frame, whereas the much larger ones were likely made thousands of years prior to the arrival of the Polynesians. And here we see one of the Pukaus, which has been turned into a water vessel. So again, recycling. And sadly, the population of Easter Island dropped after contact with Europeans from possibly 10,000 plus people down to a population of only 111. So 
The population now is a mix of Polynesian and European heritage in general. And as we drive past the airport, which you have to do to get anywhere. And so this is part two of exploring Easter Island or Rapa Nui. Little tiny place, only five miles by seven miles by ten miles and more than 2,000 miles away from Chile or, and or the west coast of South America. So the infrastructure is relatively modern, taking into account how far away it is from anything. And we're on one of the paved roads, one of the few paved roads on the island, heading towards the Rano Raraku Quarry. So here we are at the quarry itself. And this is where more than 900 of the Moai figures were um, excavated, or that's where the quarry is. So we're walking around here, and pretty soon you're going to be able to see many of these. There are more than 300, I believe, still in the quarry area. And as you can see, they're basically buried up to their shoulders or even up to their necks, but each one is a full body. And there's one in the quarry that you will see, unfinished, that would have weighed 180 tons if it had been finished, which it wasn't. And also there are two different varieties of Moai. There are ones with flat noses and others like this one with more of a, some would say European style nose. So it is quite possible that there were two different time periods of their construction. So again, this is the classic, uh, classic view of what most people associate with Easter Island. Again, buried up to their necks unless the heads are broken off, and 950 of them on the island. One of these ones on the right-hand side was excavated by Thor Heyerdahl, and it proved that the Moai heads are in fact full bodies. And the one that he excavated, I believe, was more than 20 feet tall. So moving farther along, these are the classic ones with the so-called aquiline nose. And then here we see a much smaller one that is lying down on its front. So I believe that there were two different time periods of construction, that the ones with the aquiline noses, which are the tallest ones, were made first by a pre-Polynesian culture. And then the Polynesians arrived about 1,000 years ago, likely from Tahiti, and they started to copy on a much, much smaller scale. So the mystery is who were the original builders? Again, you see some a small one lying down and then much, some much larger ones that are buried up to their necks. And that is the quarry in the background. And here again, some detailed views of some of the larger ones. And this one has a ship carved onto its torso. Now it is quite possible that originally it was carved as a canoe and then later on the sails were added once European contact was made sometime in the 1720s. And now we're going to approach one that is still in the quarry. Quite massive one the material is actually volcanic tuff, which is a concentrated volcanic ash that has been compressed over the course of likely hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And this gives you the view of the entire figure that was never finished. Moving farther and farther along, this is on the outskirts of the actual crater itself. Uh, the whole thing is the quarry. And now we're approaching 
a little moai that I believe is the only one ever found in a kneeling position. And in the far distance you'll see Tongoriki, which is a site we're going to get to very soon. So this gives you the landscape from the quarry edge itself. And you see the multiple moai that were never moved to any other place on the island. Almost all of the moai that were moved and placed in position face inland. They do not face the ocean, but there are seven that will be in another video which in fact face the ocean and they are called the seven navigators. So this is a view of the quarry and there in the center is the one that would have weighed about 180 tons but was never completed. And now we're farther along on the outer edge of the quarry and we're actually going to climb inside of it. So this is my third time to Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and the first time that I was ever able to actually get into the crater itself. Here again you see volcanic stone material and then volcanic ash or mud and then there is a small lake in the middle of the quarry area. It's an ancient volcanic crater of course. And moving along you'll see that there are Totora reeds growing in this little lake. There are actually also Totora reeds growing in a much larger lake on the island. And Totora reeds are native to this island as well as the coast of Peru and Lake Titicaca in Peru and Bolivia. And if you look very carefully in the background, you'll see more of the moai, once again buried up to the shoulders or up to the necks. And you're not allowed to get too close to them because there are still excavations going on. But this is the fence from which you can see that there are quite a few of them there still inside the crater. And now this is Tongariki, which is the largest ceremonial platform or ahu on the island. And there are 15 of the moai that have been put back up because the whole uh, ahu altar was hit by a tsunami in the 1960s, I believe. And then these are the so-called hats that uh, belonged on top of the moai. In fact, it's indicative of red hair with a top knot which is the traditional way that uh, many Polynesians wear their hair. So that's a mystery. Could it possibly mean that the first people who lived on Easter Island or Rapa Nui were actually red-headed people? And so here you see the different shapes and sizes, and there is one of them with its top knot, or pukau, put back into position. And again, another view of the moai that have been put back up again. And now we're going to go around the backside and look how massive this ahu is. The blank space on the right part of the screen now could mean, according to our guide Alejandro, that there were spaces for possibly seven more moai to be placed in position at a future time. Now the hill in the background is it's called the Poike Ditch and that is where a fierce battle happened between what were called the Long Ears and the Short Ear people. The Long Ears were the nobility and the Short Ears were the common folk. And the Short Ears decided to kill off the nobility, most likely due to a, a problem with drought at one time. Uh, prior to the arrival of the first Europeans, theoretically, in the 1720s. And now you see shattered parts of smaller moai. And you see that one on the right side has quite a polished surface. So it is possible that some were made of a harder material than the volcanic tuff. And in fact, there is one in the British Museum which is made of very hard basalt, and it's unknown how that material 
was shaped if the only uh, tools that the Rapa Nui people had was in fact basalt. How do you shape basalt with basalt? And finally, we're driving by the uh, ocean here, and this is a little recreation of a Polynesian village. This stone structure is actually a chicken house, so the chickens would come in and out of that hole you see on the left. And um, chickens were very important to the diet of the Rapa Nui people, and were likely brought from Tahiti when they discovered and decided to inhabit the island with their um, chief called Hotumatua. So here again, a relatively simple construction of volcanic stone. And there's the hole for the chickens to go in with banana trees as well growing on the inside. This is an ancient earth oven being shown to us by Alejandro similar to a luau in Hawaii. And then this is a house. Originally it's believed that the first settlers used their canoe hulls uh, to make a house. But of course over the course of time they would have rotted away and there was limited wood on the island. Basically only the milo tree I believe or miro tree. And so instead, they're made with smaller um, tree trunks and, of course, thatch roofing. And then this is a recreation of a garden. I'm not sure if these are gourds or if they're watermelon. They look more like watermelon to me. Uh, I don't believe that watermelon is uh, indigenous to Polynesia, but it's just a way to recreate what a gourd garden would look like. And now we get to see the interesting finely shaped stones of the base of the canoe house. And so once again, this is part two of a five or six part series that I'm doing about my recent trip to Easter Island in October of 2018. And I look forward to sharing more of the interesting aspects and mysteries of Rapa Nui. And here we are on one of the dirt roads on Easter Island. I think only the main highway is actually paved, but it's maintained in pretty good condition. And today, or at this point in the video, what we're going to explore are the large red scoria stones that were used to uh, place on top of the Moai figures. So this is the quarry of Punapau. So in the background you can see some of the semi-finished stones. Again they've represented to some people uh, a hat of some kind but it's more likely that they were top knots because Polynesian people to this very day, especially women but some men, wear their hair up as a top knot in order to keep their necks cool because after all this is the tropics. So again these are some of them in different stages of completion and this is the main quarry where you find this red scoria stone which of course is volcanic because the entire island is volcanic. There is a glimpse at the coastal area and the little town of Hangaroa, which is the only town on the island of any size. Easter Island is 7 miles by 5 miles by 10 miles in size and is located more than 2,000 miles from the coast of Chile. So here you can see the color of the, the red soil. And now we're looking down into the quarry itself. Once again, you can see some in different stages of finish. They would be roughed out and then rolled up to the top and then rolled down to where the moai was that uh, was going to wear this interesting top knot adornment. 
Rapa Nui or Easter Island is a phenomenal place to visit and um, it's not that expensive to fly from Santiago de Chile and well worth a trip lasting I would guess or estimate five to six days you can see basically everything and so we're driving to another location now and this is Ahu Akivi and this is where we have seven of the full Moai figures these are the only seven out of something like 950 that face the ocean all the other ones face inland and in fact the heads are cocked slightly backwards so that they're facing the sky which is quite curious and of course that's a great uh, subject for ancient alien or ancient astronaut enthusiasts um, our local guide Alejandro said that they were looking up to their home star system which is intriguing if you believe that uh, the ancestors of people came from another planet so once again, these are the seven navigators. Supposedly they were sent by Hotumatua, who was the original chief of Easter Island. And it's quite probable that the Polynesian people originally came from Tahiti approximately a thousand years ago. But the question is, since the island is so tiny, how could you even find it in the first place? The oral tradition story says that it was a major person in the uh, Tahitian nobility who had a dream about this little island and through that dream he was able to assist in navigating from Tahiti to Easter Island. Now notice the quality of the stonework at the very bottom. Uh, much of the content of these videos except this one discusses the concept that there were two different civilizations that lived on Easter Island. The Polynesians who arrived approximately a thousand years ago, as I said, and then a more technologically sophisticated civilization that came before that. The question is from where? Some theories are that they in fact came from ancient India, from the Indus Valley civilization, but again, how they would ever have found this little tiny island is one of its greatest mysteries and not very often discussed by academics because that's a very inconvenient question to ask as are questions about who built the giant megalithic sites in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, etc. They tend to dodge these questions rather than face them. So now in the main part of the video we're going to be exploring lava tube systems of which there are extensive ones, some larger than others. This could be the largest of all of them. You can see that banana plants have been placed in sunlight, surrounded by stone, so that means that they would grow very well in this area. Very clever job by the ancient Rapa Nui people. And now we're going to explore into this lava tube, lava tube system I believe we walked more than one and a half kilometers or about one mile underground. Now the story goes from our guide Alejandro that the reason why these uh, lava tubes were inhabited was that at one time or possibly at many times in the history of the island there was famine as the result of extensive climate change. This could have been the result of major fluctuations in the El Nino uh, system just off the coast, uh, uh, western coast of South America. And so these would be places of refuge during wartime when people were fighting over very scarce resources. I had been to Rapa Nui twice before and explored a much smaller cave system, but you can see how extensive this one is. This again is our group who went there with Hidden Inca Tours in October of 2018. And here again, an open area where taro is growing and sugarcane, I believe, as well. So these people, when they were in refuge, actually had gardens that would sustain them. And there's a lot of underground water on Easter Island or Rapa Nui because 
it's in the tropics, it tends to rain a fair bit, especially in June, July, and August. Fortunately, we were there in October, so we had some overcast days, but it wasn't really all that bad. So here's a wall that was built by the ancient people. And now we're going to go, we're going to go even deeper into the system. Again, a natural lava tube created during the formation of this part of the island. Rapa Nui has quite an extensive history with different uh, times of volcanic activity. I believe there are three major craters on the island that, uh, that make up the whole system. And so we're going deeper and deeper into the darkness. And there again, you can see an open area where plants were growing. But this is the darker part that leads to an opening at the very end. Here again is another opening where a small garden is. And there is Alejandro on the left-hand side. He is by far, in my estimation, the best guide on Rapa Nui. So if you want to know how to contact him, uh, you can contact me through my website, hiddenincatours.com. We are planning probably to go back to Rapa Nui in two years, so in 2020. And so I'll have that listed on my website if you want to join us. There right in front of us is Gustavo, who's our Bolivian tour coordinator. And this is the darkest part of the tunnel that we are exploring now. The population of Rapa Nui is about six to 7,000 people. Half of them are native people from the island and the other half are Chileans. And about 75% of the island is the national park. So this, of course, is part of the national park, as, as are, are, are all of the other ancient locations, uh, temples. Um, more than 300 of the Moai stone figures, which are full bodies, not just heads, are located in the quarry area. And that will be in another video. Again, this will be between... Uh, it'll be either five or six part series, and then I'm going to upload the whole thing, which will be about a one-hour documentary, onto Amazon Prime Video, where you can either rent it or purchase it if you want to. So here we are at the very end, and climbing our way back out through the thickets, and different tropical plants. This is me finally climbing out from underground and being greeted by our tour group. And then here comes Antonio from Australia, probably the largest member of our group in this case. I think he's six feet four. And he's having a little bit of trouble trying to get back out of the cave system, but success. So here we are driving on their quote-unquote highway. And this is our first stop at uh, looking at ancient ruins. So you see some, what may have been a damaged uh, tiny temple on the left-hand side. And this is our actual first stop, the Ahu Tepito Kura. And what's interesting about here is that there is a stone which seems incredibly even in shape and it's highly metallic, or sorry, magnetic, as if it obviously has iron content. So as we walk past uh, the ruins of an Ahu, which is a, a temple platform, we get to the location of this first interesting exploration. And there we have it. You see the central stone, which must weigh 200 pounds at least, and then the four stones around it. Supposedly the stone was found on the island. Uh, some say it was brought from somewhere else. But our guide, Alejandro, is going to show you 
that it affects a compass in some quite fascinating ways. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get into the little temple complex here because it's very sacred to the Rapa Nui people. But the other people who were with us in our October tour said definitely that the compass acted quite strange when Alejandro, who is the best guide on Rapa Nui, when he brought his compass close and then took it away from it. And nearby we have this other temple Ahu complex and it appears to be constructed in two different ways, relatively crude on the left hand side and then more sophisticated on the right hand side. And so it could mean that there were two different cultures that lived here, an early megalithic presence and then later the arrival of the Polynesians about a thousand years ago. So there is the cruder work on the left and then the more sophisticated work on the right. In this series of five videos you will see examples of megalithic work and the probability of lost ancient high technology on Easter Island in the very distant past. And now we're coming up to what is called a pukau or pukau and that is the top knot that was put on top of the Moai figures. Um, Moais are the humanoid figures or human figures that most people think of as simply being uh, a head or a head and a neck but in fact each one originally was a full body and there are hundreds of them on the island. In fact there are 950 of them on the island. So what we're doing now is we're coming closer to another Ahu platform and as I zoom in you'll see some very large slabs of basalt which is a very tough stone, hard stone and the hardest tools that the Rapa Nui people had was in fact basalt. So shaping basalt with basalt is not very efficient. We're now at Anakena Beach and it is the only major uh, sandy beach on the island. You see all of these uh, coconut palms that were brought in relatively recently from Tahiti. The island was denuded by the fact that it was turned into a sheep farm in the 19th century and all of the inhabitants of the island were restricted to a tiny area on the island. Very cruel history this place has. So as we get closer to this Ahu, which has seven figures on it, I believe the restoration of it was done in the 1950s by Thor Heyerdahl and his team who went to explore the island. They were the first archaeological team uh, or major archaeological team to go there. And what I'd like you to look at is the bottom row of stone that you see there on the Ahu. You see some kind of rough stone on top, but the lower row is fine blocks of basalt that evenly, tightly fit together. Again, we're going to look at this one more time, and you see it's in a slightly upward arcing shape. Look at the cruder elements of the rest of the Ahu. And now we're going to walk around the back side of it and I'm going to zoom in to some stones, two of them, which are large basalt blocks, each weighing I would think at least a ton apiece. The quarry is not in the area, it's at the other side of the island and these look very finely shaped, unlike some of the other features that we see. So again, I think there were two different cultures on the island the Polynesians arriving about 1,000 years ago and prior to that a more high-tech culture that did fine work. You see the inferior nature of the stones you're looking at here, just rough stone. So now continuing at Anakena, we're going to uh, look at some more stones that look to be out of place. So you can see once again two relatively large pieces of basalt stone. This one relatively nicely shaped.
And then we come to the ruins of what was literally a boathouse, as in human habitation. But what they would do in early times is take a canoe and flip it over and put it on this foundation made of uh, very nicely shaped basalt stones once again with drill holes, probably hand drill holes or, or pounded into the stone, not necessarily an example of lost ancient high technology. And then finally we're going to look at uh, some other things of interest here at Anakena. There's a very crudely shaped shrine as you can see. And here another shrine of mixed stones, some small ones, but then also broken sections of the long ones that we saw at the Boathouse Foundation. Once again, the holes don't appear to be have done by a machine or anything like that. And this shows you the backside of the uh, Ahu complex at Anakena, the seven Moai, five of them with the Pukau top knots on them, different shapes which could indicate different levels of hierarchy, at least that's according to our guide Alejandro. And each one is always, the Pukaus are always red and that may indicate an ancient people who lived there that actually had genetically red hair because the first accounts by explorers, especially the crew of the Dutch explorer Rogovin in about 1720, indicated that there were black-haired people, red-haired people, and even blonde-haired people on the island. And some were tall, some were short, some were light-skinned, some were dark-skinned. So this um, kind of flies against the uh, typical academic studies that state simply that the Polynesians were the first humans there beginning about a thousand years ago. And once again, we see a grove of very nice coconut palms brought in from Tahiti relatively recently because the, the fact that it was a sheep farm for something like 75 years uh, basically denuded the island. It was a British company, I believe, that was given license by the Chilean government to basically devastate the environment. But what we're here for is to look at the beautiful ancient aspects of this little gem of an island, basic, more or less in the middle of nowhere. And so this is something you're going to see in part five. It's another Ahu complex, but this is located at a site called Tahai. Now we're at an ancient location close to the small town of Hangaroa, and this is called Tahai. And this is also where some of the most famous of the Moai figures of Easter Island are located. So you can see that it was an ancient canoe port, so it's quite likely that during the pre-European times that Tahai was a very important location for the Polynesian people that still inhabit the island itself. And this Ahu, which is a small temple complex, has one of the Moai figures which has been put back into place because more or less all of the Moai figures were knocked down during tribal warfare likely in the 17th century. And we can see that eyes have been put back into place and also the Pukau top knot also has been put back. So this is what a traditional one of the Moai look like, and there are 950 of them, more or less, located on the island. So as we walk further, we see more of the Tahai complex. You can see another Moai that has been put back up into place, but the eyes have not been put back on, neither has the Pukau top knot, and once again the Pukau top knot likely was the color of the people's hair, which in every case the Pukau is red. So whether that was dyeing of the, um, of the hair using volcanic clay 
or whether the people actually had genetically red hair is something up in, in, uh, in question. It seems that there were two different civilizations living on Easter Island. First, uh, mysterious people who seem to have the capacity to do lost ancient high technology cutting of stone on some level and then later the Polynesian people about 1,000 years ago. Whether or not there was an overlap of these people is still in question. And then on our last full day, uh, Gustavo Morales and I went to this location uh, which I had been to once previously. It was not part of our tour, but we had some free time, so we decided to visit this Ahu, which very few visitors see. And here again we can see a Moai figure put back on top. Look at the quality of the stonework right below the Moai and here in the middle of the video frame. Very precise cutting, very tightly fitting together. We see that at four or five other locations, so that's why I believe that there were two different civilizations that lived on the island. The Polynesian people who came from Tahiti about 1,000 years ago, and then an earlier mysterious culture that had the capability of cutting stone with quite precision. Again, look at the tightness of the fit of the stonework. And here again, this gives you a sense of it in detail. You can see that originally the stones fit very tight together. Some still do. Others have been put back into place. And so this is our last complex that we're visiting on the island for this time. We'll probably go back on tour in 2020. And as a final little teaser, we're exploring to the left side of the Ahu. And we're going to look at a damaged Ahu here. Ahu is the word for temple. There you see a Moai on the left, quite a small one, that has fallen down and broken. But then again, look at these relatively precisely cut pieces of stone. They don't really fit in with the standard Polynesian technique of simply stacking volcanic stone one on top of another. And so that's why this island has many more mysteries than most people realize. There you see quite a simple wall in the background. And again, as this final little bit goes on, we're exploring these giant, relatively giant slabs of stone that are presently out of place, but seem to have been originally quite precisely cut.